Okay, the purpose of this video is to talk about some of the logic behind the scientific method and presenting the scientific method as being a series of steps that I'm going to emphasize their arrangement in this order, starting with observation, then theory, then hypothesis that yields evidence. Now, this order may seem a little unusual to you. Uh, often when you hear about the scientific method, uh, people tend to put hypothesis first, followed by theory. And the reason that they do that is because you think of hypotheses as being smaller in scope and lots of hypotheses tests building up to build a theory. And that's true. But the reason I have them in this particular order, with theory coming first and hypothesis coming second, is to emphasize the principle that you derive a hypothesis from a theory. That having developed a theory, the way that you proceed to test or validate the usefulness and value of your theory is from that theory deriving testable hypotheses that then yield evidence to either support or challenge that theory. Okay, so I'd like to give you an analogy for how that works, stepping away from the traditional sciences and thinking about, imagine yourself an archeologist and you travel out to the middle of the desert in the middle of Egypt somewhere, and you have a hunch from a variety of previous uh, historical records and whatnot that if you go into this region of the desert, you're gonna find some interesting stuff. And so let's say you start off by digging right here, and you find something neat. Uh, say it's a particular type of statue. And then over here, uh, you dig here and you find something else uh, that's interesting and say it's, um, you know, uh, a, a plaque with some inscription of a particular type of hieroglyphics. And then you dig over here and you find something different. Say it's a bit of, um, you know, what looks to be the remnants of an altar. Okay. And so what you have here is a number of discrete observations. And what you start thinking about in the scientific method is you want an explanation that ties all of this together. These are what ties together these individual discrete tidbits of information in a way that makes sense big picture. And so you start to think, aha, based on the type of statue this is and the type of hieroglyphics these are and the way that this uh, what looks to be the remnants of an altar is constructed. I think I know what's going on underneath here. And you think to yourself, I think that what is in this whole area is the remains of a 14th century BC temple of the god Aten. Uh, because that's the type of temple that would have these things arranged in this way. And then you can say, okay, let me proceed to investigate. Is that really what's going on here? So you build this mental map, a mental model of if this area really was the temple of the 14th century BC god Aten, um, well then I predict we should be able to dig right here and we would find the corner of a wall. And so you do dig there, and let's say that what you find. And we should be able to dig right here and find the other corner of the wall. And then we should be able to dig right here and find a gate. And we should be able to dig right here and find jars, uh, the remnants of the jars of incense. And you keep making these predictions about if what really going on underneath is what you think, I believe the thing that ties this whole thing together is the 14th century temple of the god Aten, then you can keep making predictions. We should be able to dig here and find a particular thing. And let's say you do. Uh, we should be able to dig here and find a particular thing. And let's say at each step, your prediction is confirmed by finding what you expect to find. Let's bring it back here. We started off with a set of discrete observations. You observe this, you observe that, and you observe that. And then 
you came up with a big picture explanation, a big idea that would serve to tie these observations together. You develop this mental picture of what you think is going on uh, big picture, and that's your theory. I think that this is the 14th century BC god uh, Aten's temple. Okay, now note that your theory is not fact. Just by saying, that's what I think this is, you haven't created that. What you've created is a potential explanation, a theoretical explanation of what would account for these observations. Okay, well, how do you know that that's a good theory? How do you know that your explanation is a, is, is a valid, useful, worthwhile explanation? Well, what you did from it is generate predictions, and those are your hypotheses. You proposed, if that's what's really going on in this area, we should be able to dig here and find a particular thing. And so you go and dig there, and that's what you found. And so what you had is, from your theory, you derived a prediction a hypothesis that you could then test, and the outcome of that test, let's say it's confirmed, that provides you with evidence. Note that really evidence is just a new observation, which brings you back to the beginning. But it's a very specific type of observation. It was a systematically tested, uh, for, based on a systematic prediction a hypothesis derived from your theory. And if it is confirmed, it serves as an observation that supports your theory. Say it wasn't confirmed, that you made this prediction, but that's not what you found there. Well, that is some evidence, a new observation that suggests perhaps potential refinement or even uh, discarding your theory might be worthwhile. Okay, but for now we're sticking with the, with the, for the sake of the example, let's say each one of these predictions is confirmed. Okay, to review what, I, what I've covered so far, I'm focusing on the distinction between a theory and a hypothesis. So to sum up, what is the difference between, in this analogy, a theory versus a hypothesis? Well, first of all, you, a theory is a mental model. And so a theory, again, is not reality. It is a set of ideas. It's a big connected set of ideas that ties together a bunch of observations. And so it's big picture. And that the goal of a theory is that it ties together many observations. Okay, so a theory is about the overall explanation that ties together a bunch of facts. From the theory are derived hypotheses. Hypotheses are narrow and specific. They are predictions. So, here, based on the theory that what's in this whole area is this 14th century BC temple, that you can derive specific predictions, like I predict we should be able to dig here, and if we do, we will find this thing. And so they are tests of the theory. Now that brings us to a very pressing problem in the logic of the scientific method. And this is a concept that causes a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about how science really works. And that is the question of scientific proof. And I'm gonna put proof in scare quotes. Think about it this way. You started with, a th you know, we started with observations. And from your observations, you generated a theory. And from that theory, you tested that theory with a bunch of specific predictions. And in this analogy that I've given you, every specific prediction that you made, all your hypothesis tests, ended up supporting your theory. I predict we should dig here and we would find this, and you did. I predict if we dig here, we would find this, and you did. I predict we would dig here and you find this, and you did. So what I've depicted here is, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six different hypotheses that were tested, and each one 
supported the theory. The prediction turned out the way uh, you would expect it. Have you proven your theory? No, you haven't. Well, how many of these hypotheses could you confirm to have to prove the theory? Okay, the reason you haven't proven your theory is you know, you've generated all this evidence with these confirmed hypotheses, but you don't yet know what's under here, what's under here, what's under here, what's under here. You might uh, eventually hit on something that, whoa, wait a minute, that's not what we expected to find, causing you to question your theory. So the issue is, how many of these hypotheses do you need to test that it would eventually add up to proof? Well, what if you dug there, there, and 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 every step of the way? What if you dig this entire area up, and at every single step of the way, every single one of those hypotheses is confirmed by finding exactly what you expected to find? Have you yet proven your theory? And the answer is resoundingly no, because you cannot ever truly prove this theory. And let me explain why. Even if you dug up this entire area and at every step of the way you found exactly what you predicted to find, adding all of this, well, maybe you don't know that, well, what if you dug way out over here and found hmm, a bathing pool or something that would lead you to entirely change what you think about, wait a minute, this isn't the... 14th century temple of the god Aten, this is the, you know, 13th century BC temple of the cult of Nefertiti, because that would have been built exactly the same way as an Aten temple, except with the addition of a bathing pool out there. Well, you don't yet have that information. And you have, you know, so you, you have to leave open the possibility that no matter how much evidence you have for this theory, you have to leave the door open for the possibility that new information could always come along that would not fit with the theory. Another possibility is, well, you know what? Let's say you get as much evidence as you can conceivably imagine, each step of the way supporting your theory that this is the 14th century BC temple of the god of Aten. Well, it is still possible that what you actually have here was um, built in the 1950s. It was built by some uh, movie producer who was filming some epic movie about the history of Egypt. And then at the end of the movie, they figured it was easiest to just bury the whole thing up. You know, it may sound silly, but that is actually, there are documented cases of this happening. If you're interested in the history of movies, this is kind of a tangent. Um, but after the uh, movie, The Ten Commandments was filmed, they basically just buried a bunch of the sets in the desert. And, you know, maybe someday, hundreds of years from now, archaeologists will find that and be really mistaken about what's going on there. But here's the point, is that even if you've got a lot of support for your theory, it never adds up to true logical proof of the theory beyond uh, any question because... There is always other possibilities that you have not ruled out that could also account for the observations that you've gathered. Okay, let me take that even a step further. Another possibility, a, a competing theory that you have not yet ruled out is that maybe even all this evidence that looks like it's supporting your theory that it's the 14th century temple of Aten, maybe what actually happened is that a few years ago, aliens from outer space came here and created all these things that look like ruins and buried them under the desert as a way of playing an elaborate practical joke on the human archeologists. Okay. That sounds like a ridiculous explanation. It is not really very plausible, but as a scientist, in, in scientific logic, you would have to admit you do not have the information that would rule out that possibility. So even though it's kind of an absurd argument, logically, 
you have to be open to alternative explanations that you have not ruled out. But are we justified in saying, even though we can't rule out the possibility of an alien practical joke, we are better off sticking with the theory of the god Aten temple, or maybe even, a, you know, a worse theory uh, is the movie set director. Um, and then the even worse theory is the alien practical joke. Yeah, here's why we are justified in ranking the validity of these theories in that order. And what it is called is the principle of parsimony. The principle of parsimony is when evaluating competing theories, when you don't have the evidence in front of you that causes you to say one theory is better supported than the other, you still are justified in accepting one theory as more plausible than the other based on which theory is most parsimonious. And parsimony has to do with simplicity, but a very specific type of simplicity. Simplicity in the terms of how many different assumptions, untested assumptions behind that theory that would be necessary for it to be valid would we have to accept in order for that theory to be worthwhile. So let's look at our three theories here. Okay, we've got 14th century temple of the cult of the god Aten, and then we've got the movie set, and then we've got the alien practical joke. Okay, so these are our three competing theories. And, all right, in order for the theory of the 14th century temple of Aten to be true, well, there would have had to have been temples in the 14th century, in this area, that would have, over the years, uh, decayed and gotten buried. And, yeah, all of these assumptions behind this theory that would be necessary in order for it to be true, there's independent evidence for all of these things. All of the historical records suggest that, yeah, that's a reasonable thing to believe, that's a reasonable thing to believe, that's a reasonable thing to believe, that's a reasonable thing to believe. Well, what about the movie set idea? Well, in order for that to be a valid theory explaining what you found in the desert, well, that would mean that an assumption behind that theory was that there was a movie produced at some point that would have used that as a set. And that after the movie was produced, the set was buried. Okay, well, is there any independent evidence that you, that there was ever a movie like this that was produced? Um, and that the, you know, they, be well, you could go to, you know, all the movies and the whole catalog of movies that, uh, all the movies that involve ancient Egypt and watch them all and, or just ask an expert and say, was there ever a movie, um, that had, you know, would have used a set like this? And if there was, was there any evidence, any records, any memos from movie producers, any people, actors writing in their biography, autobiographies, whatnot, that, oh yeah, we made the movie and then we buried the set. These assumptions, um, if you have no independent evidence that suggests that these are valid assumptions, that that makes this a more parsimonious theory. Now, what about this one here? This would involve accepting the assumption that, number one, there are aliens. And number two, that they can travel to Earth. And number three, they have the technology of cap being capable to produce all this stuff out in the desert. And then number four, that these aliens actually have the motivation to go through all this trouble to play a practical joke on you. Okay. Even comparing these assumptions to this assumption, these are at least things that although there's, 
you know, they are less reasonable assumptions than these. These are still more reasonable than these because, you know, well, at least we know there are movies. We have been making movies for the past, you know, 100 years or so. Um, often movie producers do outrageous things um, in, in the course of making movies. Yet there is no really reasonable scientific evidence that, that these assumptions are worthwhile. So the principle of parsimony is even when you have a variety of competing theories that could equally explain your observations, you're justified or even encouraged to accept the most parsimonious theory. Now, again, this is not proving the theory, but it just tells you which one is the most reasonable to accept for now until new evidence comes along. But let's get to that, back to that question of scientific proof. And I'm, I'm making the argument here that in the logic of uh, the scientific method building theories by testing hypotheses, there is no such thing as true unequivocal proof of a scientific theory. There are theories that can have so much evidence supporting them. So, for instance, the theory of gravitational attraction that, you know, explains why we just don't float away from the surface of the Earth or why a ball drops when you uh, drops towards the ground when you let go of it. There are theories uh, like evolution by natural selection um, that have so much evidence for them that it becomes irrational or silly to reject them on the grounds of, oh, well, it's not been proven. But that's not the same thing as saying that there's true conclusive proof of a scientific theory. And in part two of this video, uh, I'm going to explain in more formal logic uh, uh, exactly why that is.